we'll now have a, a discussion on how traditional content owners can win in the digital world. And with me to discuss this are David Ball, who heads up distribution and business development at the BBC, Marco Frazier, who heads distribution and business development for the UK and Western Europe at AMC Networks International, Kat Hebden, the MD of Shotglass Media and head of digital at Fremantle Media, David Webster from the Media and Telecom Unit of Kaltura, and Jim Bentz, who heads business development at CSG International, who we heard from earlier. To start with, if I can ask uh, each of you uh, to briefly introduce yourself, we know your names now, um, but tell us what you do in your role and from your perspective how traditional media companies are going to compete in this much more complex context that we've heard of. If I can start with you, David. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, so I work in a group called Distribution and Business Development at the BBC um, and we look at the relationships, uh, the syndication relationships basically of, of all the BBC services, so whether that be with uh, pay platforms, whether it be with... Um, OEMs uh, for both linear and um, uh, our IP products. The, the, the question's a broad one, we can talk about it all day, but uh, to boil it down very simply, you have to have fantastic content and it has to be distributed well. And that's about the distribution being appropriate to the platforms. Um, that includes the content being discovered well, it includes it being marketed well so that people can kind of uh, understand that, that it's there and that comes to it. And those are the two kind of key issues. If you haven't got the content, people aren't going to come. If you haven't got the distribution, people aren't going to find the content. Marco? Thanks. Yeah, so I'm Marco Fraser with AMC Networks International. I look after the distribution of our portfolio of channels in the UK and Western Europe. On a global basis, AMC has more than 60 channel brands. That's uh, a lot. Uh, and included among those brands is our flagship service, the AMC Channel, which here in the UK is available exclusively with our partner, BT. Uh, I think the simple answer is not so different to, to yours in the sense that we're adapting to the shifting landscape by continuing to invest even more in distinctive, high-quality, original programming, <coughs> and putting ourselves in a position to control more of the rights around that than, than before. It's, it's becoming really essential to control as much of the rights as you can. So towards that end, AMC Studio is now investing more than one billion a year in original content. So for a, a company of our size, that's a very significant uh, investment. We're also uh, looking at uh, direct-to-consumer plays that are complementary, not cannibalistic, to our, our core channels and brands. Uh, just two examples that I'll mention very quickly of that include Shutter, which is up and running active here in the UK. Uh, Shutter is a premium SVOD service focused on thriller, suspense, and horror category. Uh, another example is Sundance Now, uh, which is a premium SVOD service complementary to the Sundance TV channel. So there's no overlap of, of content at all. Uh, and both those services are top 10 SVOD services uh, in the US. So I, I think that at AMC, we believe that uh, quality content uh, will always find an audience. So we see it as our job to really build out the relationship with our fan base around our franchise series. And luckily, so far, we've got a pretty good track record with uh, shows like Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, Free the Walking Dead, and others. OK, Kat, it gets harder as we go down the line, but no, can you I feel answer like I've that? I've forgotten the question. I'm joking. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm Kat. I head up uh, Shop Glass, which is Fremantle's digital label. Um, previously, we looked after all of the brand extensions around the big shows, um, X Factor, Got Talent, The Apprentice, uh, to name a few. Uh, but now we focus on original uh, content production for digital uh, globally for the company. Um, and so that's quite a big question to start with. I don't think I can answer it in a minute. Um, I think we've always known as a TV company that our audiences are on digital since the kind of Susan Boyle moments. And uh, we did 16 billion video views on YouTube alone around our shows last year. So we know, we know our audiences are there. We know it's, it's more than just putting your TV content online. And I think, I suppose you need to define what winning is and what success is. I think everyone in this room would probably like to see a business model at the end of it. But I don't think that's necessarily your starting point. I think for us in digital, it's about building brands. And so... I guess in, to answer the question, in order to kind of win, uh, you, it's, it's a lot of things. I think you need to be agile, you need to be creative. I think you need to understand your audiences, where are they consuming the content, how are they consuming it, what platforms they're consuming it. Understanding the platforms, we have a, um, a data-led strategy. Um, and I suppose to your point, you know, it, that's all about content, but distribution is also incredibly important. Um, I, I was at a conference recently and someone said, and I'm sure you've all heard this, that... Uh, 
distri- you know, a content is king, but distribution is queen, and she's wearing the trousers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Daniel, you don't have any, uh, any content. Can you tell us a little bit about Kaltura and how you can help? Uh, so Kaltura uh, powers, enables a lot of the uh, um, companies which are represented here, uh, among them Disney, along with my gentleman to the uh, left, and Viacom, Turner, and various others. Uh, we sort of think about it as uh, there being the ability to take great content, and you have to start with great content, but then provide business models around it, and they're very variable in this day and age, and, they, and uh, I would sort of argue that you have to be uh, flexible and agile in that, and to do that with a great user experience uh, at scale, uh, because you need a television-like experience, and having the data feedback path is critical, and uh, I'll just sort of uh, morph little, a little bit on it. Where content is king, I would argue that distribution is the kingdom. I'm not the first one to say that, but um, it's really important to uh, be able to sort of get out there, understand, connect to your uh, end users, and uh, basically provide a personalized experience at the end of the day. And Jim, I, I guess you're not going to argue with that. <clears throat> no, I can't argue with any of that. <clears throat> so again, uh, Jim Benz, uh, for those of you who didn't see the initial presentation, I run business development for CSG's um, Ascendant platform, which again powers a lot of the um, premium service content uh, companies um, globally. As Daniel said, we do a lot of work with um, Disney and the other uh, content studios. That's where we started out. Um, we really focus on companies who have premium content. Uh, as David was saying, that they want to sell. And um, if they want to have other models like advertising on top of it, but our focus really has been been companies who want to sell, have a great experience, protect their content, and push it out to as many customers as they can through as many devices as possible. Okay, uh, David, if I can come back to you. Um, I know having worked at the BBC as a head of new media operations, how, how sensitive it can be and how difficult it can be <coughs> in uh, this situation um, to, uh, to unveil policy on the fly and so on, which uh, clearly you can't do. But um, Tony Hall talked uh, early in the year about reinventing iPlayer and effectively doubling its, its reach and its metrics. Can you tell us about how you're going to go about doing that? Well, that's just a, uh, it's just a continuing um, policy to improve iPlayer and to deliver value back to, to, to license fee payers. And, 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 you know, the BBC was putting its content online in a, in, in a video player uh, when Netflix was still sending DVDs through the post. So uh, there's been a continual march towards ensuring that we follow the audience and we ensure that wherever the audience goes, the BBC is there to support them with, with, with usage uh, um, uh, paradigms as they develop. We're seeing an enormous amount of, 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 of usage now on, on, on connected devices. And that statement's really just simply reinforcing the fact that the BBC takes serious all the different places, uh, um, all the different places that the viewer is. In terms of how we're doing it and, and the strategies that, uh, uh, that, that uh, are just an ongoing strategy of growth, uh, generally the content is what the content is. The BBC continues to make a, a fantastic um, a, a, con a content which indexes uh, amazingly well with the UK audience with, uh, and frankly there's a lot of money that goes into that, you know. Uh, we, we heard about the, the billions of pounds, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of money that the BBC spends on that, so, so, so uh, 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 we ensure that there's a next generation product that they can find that online. So in terms of iPlayer, we've, uh, uh, um, personalization is very key, so uh, sign in's a big uh, uh, piece for us at the moment. Uh, uh, that's going to ensure that the breadth of the, the BBC's library and its, its content offering is offered in the best way possible because when you've got a big library, um, that, that's difficult. Um, live Restart, for example, is a, a fantastic joining of IP and the live experience. Uh, you know, we, we help lead the way on things like downloads. Uh, uh, so, so a personalised yet curated experience that gives you the, the type of functionality that a next generation IP product needs is, is how that strategy is going to go move forward. So historically, it started out positioned as a catch-up service. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't, can't miss the unmissable. Um, and now we're talking about making it a destination in its own right. What, what's the difference, and, and how are you going to get people to go to iPlayer first? I think different products, it'd be, it, 
I think the best way to look at this is, is, to, think about, is to think about need states. And different products address different need states. So linear is a fantastic way of delivering national moments and, and shared simultaneous zeitgeist uh, uh, um, uh, experiences that everyone can, can have simultaneously. But I think increasingly, and there is a, there's definitely a reciprocity between new usage paradigms that people are taking from uh, other IP products like Netflix. When they go to our and generally on the big screen, when they go to our, our IP products to watch long form content, because uh, people will always generally watch uh, um, long form content on the biggest screen available to them, they expect to see um, certain things there. So, you know, our, our, our product set is, is, is matching that. Okay. Uh, Marco, um, AMC is perhaps best known for Breaking Bad. Um, um, many people will have watched that on Netflix and maybe associate that with Netflix. Is that a problem for you? And how do you balance the, uh, the AMC brand with um, being distributed through the place where people are watching? That's an excellent question. Before I answer that, I just mentioned that uh, together with BBC, we actually share a common project, uh, BritBox. So AMC is uh, a partner in that along with the, the BBC. And your joint venture in BBC, BBC America. America as, as, well. as well, too. So, yeah. so I guess there's no coincidence we're sitting next to each other. Absolutely. Panel. <laughs> Uh, but to, to answer your, your question about that, I, I think um, we found that there is a lot that broadcasters, traditional broadcasters, can learn from uh, the SVOD services, and, and the experience with, with Breaking Bad was, was really part of that. It's, it's quite clear that the modality of uh, viewership, of, of usage, is, is shifting, and, and we have to try and uh, keep up with that. So it became very clear how important the ability to, to binge watch. Uh, Proximus was on one of the uh, panels mm -hmm. earlier, and they were talking about the difficulty in getting those rights. Uh, you know, when when Amazon or Netflix are putting many millions on, on the table for those rights, it's it's difficult to pair those off under the existing economic circumstances. So we have to do a little bit of a, a balancing act in terms of uh, how we approach those rights. Uh, and many times, um, the productions are, are not wholly owned. Uh, we have uh, partners like BBC with the, the Night Manager or, or other uh, top quality shows. So. The rights issue can get extraordinarily complicated. But in, in general, to date, we, we've seen uh, Netflix and, and Amazon uh, really as good partners in the overall ecosystem. And I think, again, if, if we focus on, on getting our content out to the broadest base possible and, and focusing a little bit on, on fandom, creating fandom around that, then it works for the whole ecosystem. I, I think our approach is, is, is really to uh, partner with them in that way. In fact, we've done premieres uh, on social media of some of our, our new shows. So we, we've done that on Facebook. We've done that with Twitter. Uh, and uh, with Snapchat, we had uh, the most successful global lens ever, uh, which was around uh, our series Fear of the Walking Dead. Within 24 hours, we had uh, almost 2 million uh, users here in the UK on that. So, I mean, you talked about a production budget of a billion dollars, and we've heard that Netflix is six and seven. How long can you continue to see them as a distribution partner, and at what point do they become a foe and a competitor? It's a, a good question as, as well, and I, I think part of the answer to that is uh, windowing, the windowing of, of, of rights and doing that intelligently uh, allows <laughs> traditional broadcasters like us not just to, to make money from that, but really to get our content out to as broad an audience as, as possible. But it, it is a tricky balance. Okay. Hey, Kat, you're, I know you're Sorry, desperate sorry, to contribute. Do, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say, though, do you not also think that it's, it's not just about money, it's about the kind of content that's being commissioned? So we don't really have that many cable operators in the UK. And the shows that Netflix are commissioning would never have been commissioned by um, conventional broadcasters because they don't, they don't, they're not going to deliver on the overnights and they probably don't deliver to the Heartland's audience and they're probably too expensive for maybe some of those niche budgets. And I think that's super exciting because I think now the level and the, the quality of content is going up and up and up and it's going to push conventional broadcasters to use their budgets in, in I don't know, more, more inspiring ways, I think. And you have a slightly uh, different sort of programming base in, in some of your big assets, uh, things like Got Talent and X Factor and so on, which are live TV, Heartland um, TV. So it's a slightly different um, problem, I suppose, that you, you face. It is. Uh, it is. I think it's a mixture. I think, I think we're always looking to come up with the new show. We, we have a drama label as well, and they've um, had a couple of commissions recently. But it's... And 
talking about windowing is incredibly important for the TV business. For us, it's looking at not trying to, you know, trying not to cannibalise um, places where audiences are going to pay and we're going to see revenue for that. But also, from a digital point of view, I think we approach it slightly differently and we're probably less blinkered about IP ownership. Um, when we're building brands, it's more important for me that my format is everywhere and on TV rather than worrying about the kind of 50p I'm probably going to get back from that. It's got a different kind of value associated with it. And a different sort of shelf life profile. Oh, absolutely. And a lot of our short form content is actually, I mean, particularly around the sports network that we've built, but it's, it's very topical. So actually the value out, you know, next week isn't the same as the value today. Yeah. yeah. Daniel, from a, from a vendor perspective, uh, do you think that uh, media companies are, are acting fast enough in this space? I mean, in some cases they have to be conservative because they're balancing some of their, their heritage business. Okay. That's, that's an easy layout. Um, no, they should act faster, um, get into the market, experiment. Uh, experimentation is a sort of phase uh, that we're in in the industry. There are many different sort of kinds of content. Uh, as uh, Marcus said, it was sort of interesting uh, around the sort of windowing. I'm interested in why, just curious why uh, Hulu, you didn't la launch with Hulu. Um, so I'd like to sort of hear about that, but... Uh, Maybe offline. Hmm? <laughs> no, let's do it here. Go for it. <laughs> no, no, I was going to say offline. That's a discussion. <laughs> I'm purely international, not domestic, so not involved. Oh, okay. That's a good one. Um, so the, so there, are lot, there are lots of different uh, kinds of content, but uh, ultimately um, it's about finding the sort of right uh, balance of the content to the end user. And uh, I think that what we're trying to do is provide a technology platform in order to sort of enable that. Because it's not just about sort of getting the video across all those different uh, platforms, but it's then about sort of creating relevancy at the point of uh, purchase. And it's going to be different for different people. So you've got to mi mix effectively um, the AVOD, TVOD, SVOD kind of sort of models. And, you know, I think that where we've sort of where we are at the moment industry in the industry is a bit little a bit sort of uh fixed in terms of those models and we've got to become more uh experimental and more sort of agile and yes back to your original sort of question companies content providers and aggregators need to get into the space quickly but it's not easy and it's going to take time because a fundamentally, fundamentally, the economics of the model. I've lived 20 years in broadcasting, making content. On the other side, now I'm trying to sort of figure out the technology of it. It's the the underlying, the underpinning sort of economic model is fundamentally sort of changed, and it's going to take time for it to sort of uh, readjust. And then you have the giants, which aren't directly sort of represented here, and the Amazon and the Netflix, who are. Being, who have totally different business models than AMC, for instance, that has a legacy business model which it's got to protect, uh, and that makes it profoundly difficult when you know uh, Jeff Bezos can essentially give it away uh, as part of his prime time, and that creates a very different um, uh, long-term business model. Anyway. So, Jim, where do, where do you see the money coming so, from? The, the only thing that I would, I would add to that is that um, we do a lot of work with the uh, service providers and in the U.S. And, um, and, over, and over here. So we're doing work with Comcast and with uh, TalkTalk Talk over in the U.K. And basically, live linear is a big part of what they provide um, generally. And so adding that to the mix, how do you take that along with, with what the traditional broadcasters do? How do you take that and even combine that with um, catch-up windows? Uh, adding it to an SVOD window at, at a certain point, it's very complicated. And as you know, I'm just from trying to, to not only figure out how to do that, which most of our the other panelists are, are figuring out, but how do you actually up with that end of production? So that's what we kind of bring to the table is we kind of help the companies do all those experimental models being able to try all those different models out and be able to do it pretty um, quickly. Okay. If I can just uh, turn to the audience, uh, can I ask you, um, who do you think will be the winners in, in 10 years' time, or maybe five years' time, um, in the digital television and video world? Will it be traditional media companies with channel brands that we all recognize today, or will it be players that don't have a broadcast brand today? Can I ask you to, uh, to raise your hand if you think it will be the traditional TV companies? Not, not so many, and uh, 
the, the non-traditional new entrants. I think they slightly have it. I think there's some people that are hedging their bets there. Um, we can get a microphone to you if you've got any questions for our panel, so um, do try and um, attract the attention of someone with a microphone if, uh, if you've got a burning question. But um, I'll move on. Um, David, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the sign-on, and I know you're really keen to talk about that. Um, we often think that broadcasters need to build a more direct relationship with, with their viewers, and in some senses that's, that's what you're doing. You're asking for their, their email address, their date of birth, and their postcode, so you can have a continuing conversation with, with them and no doubt TV licensing. Um, I also noticed that you can have a continuing conversation with, with Facebook and Google and third parties as, as well. Um, in some senses, you know, we could be critical of broadcasters that, that haven't embraced a more direct relationship with, um, with their audience, but is it difficult for, for the BBC to do that, given its unique position and unique funding model? I think, it's, uh, I think, I think we're obliged to. I think we're obliged to ensure that uh, 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 each licence fee payer gets the best experience they can possibly get from our services. And, uh, um, you know... We're active in, on multiple different platforms in, in multiple different ways. And I think that in terms of the sign-in piece, we've had sign-in uh, uh, um, uh, uh, available on our platforms for a long time. And you know, we, we're very data-driven also. And uh, there's a, a vastly increased engagement, viewing time, uh, 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 um, number of times that you come to our services if you have a signed in experience because it's just simply better and it's it's it, it enables us to have that personal relationship and uh, i don't think it's something that that um is an issue for people we are the bbc and uh, and i think people want to have that relationship with us given the the breadth of the bbc's services across news across sport across television, across social, across all the different demographics. The ability for us to be able to kind of give, uh, you know, alerts for your favourite football team at the same time as being able to tell you when your, your, your favourite show's coming back on, I think, you know, really drives a, a, a better experience uh, for the licence fee payer. Is it the start of a slippery slope towards subscription, though? Um, I mean, this isn't really the, the, the forum for that. The, the, the National Audit Office in, has, uh, is, is asking the BBC to uh, look into and ensure that the, uh, the, the value of the licence fee is, is, is delivered to people you know, that, that pay it rather than people that don't. Um, that's not really the principle behind sign-in. Uh, uh, the principle behind sign-in is the fact that um, we want to have a more... Uh, reciprocal and a more personalised and a more engaged experience for our viewers. In terms of uh, the brand, the BBC brand, obviously incredibly well known in, in the UK and, and abroad. Yeah. Um, how important is the, the BBC brand versus the channel brand versus the programme brand? And how important is it that people go to the BBC for that experience rather than going to, to Netflix where you're also distributed or Amazon where you're also distributed? So this, is, this comes back to Marco's windowing point, doesn't it? Because um, you know, who do you... Attribution is incredibly important to us uh, across all the touch points. So, um, and, and particularly on social attribution is a problem because, you know, there are a, a lot of stuff kind of uh, shared on, on, on YouTube. The answer to your question in terms of the mother brand is it's fantastically important to us that that the value goes back. And I think the biggest challenges that we face in our distribution relationships is ensuring that whether it's a deep link, whether it's a, 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 um, a, a show which has been uploaded by us to YouTube, uh, whether it's on something that's been shared by someone on Facebook, that that attribution does go back to the BBC. And I think for any broadcaster brand, that's almost the number one issue that they face within their distribution relationships. The second part of your question around channels and, uh, and the mother brand, channels do a really great job for us. And I think that there's something within, particularly when you have a broad portfolio of content and of services, there's, there's something within people that they need a curational, aspirational um, relationship with brands and sub-brands, whether that be a channel, whether that be a service, or, or, or whether that be indeed a show or 
a, a, a particular a, a YouTube personality. That's something that we all want. And actually, when you've got available to you pretty much every single media item that's ever been made by anyone ever in the history of, of, of time at the few clicks of a, of a button, how do you navigate your way through that? And I think the BBC feels very strongly that the value of the curational brand, both of the BBC and then its, its, its channel brands, are super useful for people to do that. I mean, we see that now with Netflix, where there's a lot of kind of uh, younger folks who, you know, who, who they've got Netflix AI levels through, through, through the roof. That's because Netflix is concentrating on making that kind of content. Um, the BBC, because of its universal kind of uh, uh, approach, needs to use channel brands to ensure. So BBC Three does a good brand for us, as does uh, does a good job for us, just as uh, BBC Four does. So attribution very key. Channel brands very important. Okay, Marco. Same question to you. Um, same question I asked earlier, really, in terms of the brand relationship between AMC. I mean, I suppose effectively a studio um, versus program brands that are incredibly well uh, understood and known by by their viewers. Do you have the, the, the same issue, or can you be a, 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 a studio in the same sense as the, the major film production studios that people couldn't necessarily name which film went to, to which studio? Yeah, I think attribution, as David said, is, is critical for us as well, too, across the brands, and, and not uh, unsurprisingly, uh, the importance on, on brands is, is something that uh, we're dealing with every day. But, but I think it, your strategy and, and your response, the relationship you're going to have there really does depend on, on where you are. Uh, in the, the overall ecosystem. Mm -hmm. In that regard, uh, maybe AMC sits a little bit closer to the presentation we saw from the folks at uh, Viacom earlier and, and all those, those lovely balls. It's important to make sure that you're present in each of those spheres across there um, in, in the different ways. Um, and I think one of the ways that we're trying to do that is to experiment a, a little bit more with uh, short form content, which is a, a bit newer for us in ways that reinforce the primary series that reinforce uh, those brands. And, and that's something that uh, is really sort of non-commercial content, so it, it doesn't sort of fall w within that, uh, that disputed area in terms of what you're going to do or how you're going to do that. But it's, it's all really about uh, getting it out there with the right partners. Cap, Fremantle's a name that people might recognize from the end credits of some of their favorite shows, but they wouldn't necessarily otherwise have a relationship um, with, with Fremantle. Um, so are you in a different um, position as, as a producer, and, and what's the thinking behind Shot Glass Media? Ooh, that's a really tough question. Um, yeah, Fremantle isn't a brand, like a consumer brand at all, and um, we are known, obviously, for making great shows. Our brands are... Uh, our shows, uh, and to a lesser extent, probably our labels. Um, I actually am going to be a really annoying panellist and jump back to an earlier point, because when you ask the audience um, whether who they thought was going to make it, broadcasters or um, uh, non-content non creators, um, I don't know if anyone saw that study that Google did recently, um, where they asked a bunch of Gen Zs what brands they thought were the coolest and what brands they were most aware of. Um, so take it with a pinch of salt because Google did commission it and Google came top of the most cool and <laughs> the most aware. But also in that sort of that top um, cloud was also um, Netflix, Amazon, Facebook was up there, MTV was there, um, HBO was there. But the, the top ones really were Netflix, Amazon and YouTube. And I thought that was interesting because they are effectively distribution networks, right? They're platforms, they're tech companies. <clears throat> and although arguably I think all of those guys now want to be content brands, hence the um, investment in original content. But I think that's interesting because they're going to become bigger content brands than perhaps the traditional um, TV and production companies. I didn't answer your original question, sorry. Right. Well, that's where I think it is difficult unless you're a brand like an MTV or unless you're a BBC or unless you're a, uh, you know, a Disney. It is pretty difficult to go out on your own and have your own brand and create your own um, experience. I mean, you can create an experience. Are you going to be able to monetize it is another question. I, I think you have to do both. It's, um, and, and there's no way that you can't. And yes, it's a lot harder than it used to be because we used to live in a fairly sort of locked down, monopolistic kind of sort of world where there was only one measurement system, mm. depending on which country you were in. And, you know, the, the brand at the end of the day uh, had proxy to the audience through advertising and didn't have much of an option. 
Now they have lots of options. The consumer is king, just to play with those sort of analogies. And at, whether or not you're an aggregator or a content provider, you've got to um, experiment on lots of sort of different sort of fronts. So if you're an aggregator, I think you've got to experiment with content creation, original as has Netflix and has um, Amazon, uh, because that's going to uh, be critical for differentiation and the like. It's going to be extremely hard unless you have the scale. If you're a content provider, uh, I would argue that you have to have those distribution strategies across the four balls and various other things, and you have to experiment and you have to get the data back, but you also um, have to go direct to consumer with a niche play which is specific to a particular sort of audiences uh, and really focus in on that and drive value from that. Uh, you know, you've got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time in this day and age. That's the end, end of it. And going back to your other point, one of the biggest challenges I guess we have around our big shows is that X Factor's 12 years old now. So how do you continue to make that relevant? And one of the things we have done is invested heavily in generating digital audiences around those brands and also not being afraid to um, experiment a bit. When we introduced free in-app voting on the X Factor, I think it was two or three years ago, that actually increased the paid for vote. So there's, there's, bit, there's taking risks and also looking at the importance and the value um, of those digital audiences around existing brands. And it might not be immediate um, the models around that. OK, I see a question from the audience. If you can keep it really quick. Well, um, is this, can you hear me? Yes? We um, can. OK, you can hear me. Um, how should television providers think about licensing their content to the big S5 platforms? How do you strike the balance do you license your content to the big S4 players or do you create your own service to deliver that content? So what should TV providers, TV content providers be doing there? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go first on that. In the US market, AMC is, is doing both in the sense that uh, in the Amazon linear channel section, uh, AMC as a channel or Sundance TV as a channel are, are carried there as a, as a linear service. They also have SVOD content available there. Obviously, the strategy with, with Netflix is a little bit uh, different, but it goes back to the point I was trying to make before. If, if you're going to share your original programming, which sometimes shows up as a Netflix original out, outside of the US, even if it uh, is commissioned content, uh, it's again about uh, working with them to decide for which territories, which window is most important to you. Uh, AMC is a relatively recent entrant into the international market, so we, we don't have uh, the same kind of distribution network, the, the queen that's wearing the trousers, um, that some of our peer group, like Viacom or some of the other groups have, because they've had more time to, to build it out. So we're in a slightly different position because there are a few markets where we're not in yet, even if we're trying to get there. Don't know if that answers the question for you. Okay, thanks very much. I think we're, uh, we're coming up to the lunchtime news, so we're out of time. So uh, thanks very much for all of your views uh, today. I'm sure they could have continued that discussion uh, for some time. It's difficult to reach any firm conclusions in this uh, amount of time. The situation is obviously constantly changing. Um, whatever you do, um, you can't stand still and wait and see what happens. Um, so from me, William Cooper, and everyone at the Connected TV World Summit team, thanks for being with us uh, here this morning and thanking our panel, David Ball, Marco Fraser, Kat Hebden, Daniel Webster, and Jim Benz.